Hello. You are. Oh, Hello, Helen. Hi. How are you? Good. 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 How are you? I'm doing pretty well. It's afternoon here. We have a little respite from the rain, so we have a couple of late fall days. It's quite lovely. All the leaves are turning colors, and it's quite quite nice. Oh, beautiful. We used to have nice sunshine and mm. fall colors. Obviously, we're in we're in the interior of BC. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, are, are you near Calgary? I mean, so you're not over in BC. So British Columbia. So yeah. uh, the Shoe Swap area of the Okanagan. Oh, wine Okanagan. Country, wine yeah. country, lake country. Okay. Yeah, I know Okanagan. Okay. Yeah. We're just a little bit. The Okanagan is, we're kind of really, the Okanagan is kind of Shushwa. So we're closer to Calgary, let's say, than, yes. let's say, than Kona would be. Yeah. Yeah. I've driven that route from, um, yeah, from uh, from uh, Calgary over to Vancouver once before. It was quite beautiful. It's very, very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Very beautiful. Anyways, we're, we're hogging all the beautiful parts of the world to our, this conversation. So, Mila, yes. welcome. Where are you today? I'm just outside of San Francisco on the backside of the Oakland Hills, Walnut Creek. Okay. On Walnut Creek, okay. Wonderful. And we have Ursul News iPad from May of 22. Do you have another name you go by besides that? Well, unfortunately, I have a class on the other computer, so I'm oh. forced to go to the iPad. Oh, uh, no worries. Yeah, I've been right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, wonderful. And what is your name? It's Ursul Harrison. Ursul Harrison, okay. It's a great story behind Ursula, I'm guessing. Uh, and Kimmy, good to see you. Hi, uh, evening. Yes. Welcome. I'm sorry, I'm dialing in from London. Sorry, I don't I've 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 just dialed in, so I'm not sure if I missed something. We're just saying what? hello and check in where people are, and you're up late. Yes. Yeah. No, it's 10 o'clock. I just really, I, yeah, I only just realized we had the sessions where I thought, oh, actually I've, I've been curious about these mm. sessions. So I was like, yeah, let me join. But yes, okay. I am dialing in from London. So Great. it's a bit. And Ewa, are you able to um, talk where you are? Uh, yes. So it's Eva. Right. Eva. Okay. It's, it shows up as a W. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I am calling from Poland. Okay. Or connecting from Poland. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I, I have some slides in a bit, but I just wanted to uh, start off by asking what brought you here? Like, what are you curious about? Um, and how can we make this time useful for you? And then we'll dive into what I might want to say. Hmm. David, I'll start. I'm... Uh... Oh. Sure. I've been co I've been coaching for several years, and uh, I've been interested in your idea of uh, beyond competency to uh, wisdom um, and coaching, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a challenge for me. I, I I lead a coach training program that we um, teach according to the ICF core competencies, but I've also often wondered um, what are the other options out there? What are other things we need to think about as we help people learn to coach to another level. And I, how do I learn to coach to another level? So okay. very interested in hearing uh, uh, hearing how that might work and how I might be involved in that. Okay, yeah. So narrative coaching has started from the other place away from ICF from the very beginning. So we've learned a lot about that topic. Yeah. Yeah. I just enrolled in the coaching program last I, week. I saw, yeah. So um, I've, I've, I had taken a coaching program from one of the other institutions that was an ICF accredited institution and was not particularly pleased. But in the course of that, I found the Sage Tech book that you had uh, oh, yes. written. I right. read all thousand plus pages of it um, and have been tracking you since then. So I finally decided to take the plunge and, and oh, run the course. Oh, great. Yeah, that was quite the ordeal. It nearly did us in because <laughs> a lot of the authors had written for a lot of other chapters. I've I've edited, I think, four coaching books, and books, and and um and this one is sort of in the say in the publishing world is considered a library level reference. 
So the authors have to, you have to run at a different level. And most of the coaches were not used to running at that level. So we had to have rejecting them. No, no, it's not good enough. What do you mean? I've had this published 14 times. And I said, well, this is the new game. And we're, we're, in the, we're the big boys and girls now. We have to actually, actually show up. So it was a lot of work. And uh, I'm just really proud. And one of my main contributions um, was there's a, was a whole section on upcoming um, sort of uh, areas for coaching like around technology and things. And so I got a whole nother section of the book that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, it's because most other two uh, editors were coaching psychologists. Um, so yeah, it was quite, it was quite, quite, a, quite, a, quite a project and I think it turned out quite well. Well, um, I can confirm to your satisfaction that it has been read uh, cover to cover. <laughs> uh, I think you won a prize for that. Um, yeah. And, and Helen, what brought you here today? Um, for me, I think it's just... Uh, I've followed you a little bit throughout the year uh, with your um, every every Thursday, the Thursday of the third third Thursday, I think, of the month. Um, and I found it very different than uh, listening to other people talk about coaching itself. Um, and I think the whole idea is often I, I was trained through CTI, but there is that whole thing about, well, next steps, let's brainstorm this, let's do this. But it's kind of it's as I look back at that, it's very much driven by the coach versus by the client. Yeah. And, um, and I think also what comes up for me is just what I saw um, emulated for me is just kind of, there is an ease of coaching and um, the pace is a little bit more slowed down. So there's, mm -hmm. it allows for more presence. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's a really important time, especially for a client who is thinking and and processing some stuff, and then all of a sudden something comes up, but there's time for them to actually do it. It's not it's not kind of rushed. No, no. And we try to take a more natural pace and recognize, especially kind of in the times that we live in, that people's ability to self-regulate, to notice themselves, to process is down significantly and so you know they don't need more 27 more things to do or look at or like give me one thing i can make better about my life today um exactly yeah yeah so and eva or kimmy anything you want to share about what you're here for and what interests you um well i guess be, be beyond you know so i've i've um I've I've just done um one of David's courses, so I guess I was just curious to to find out what this is about. So sure, I'm all, all eyes open. Yes, okay. fair enough. And Eva, do you have something you want to share? Uh well, so I've been in coaching for for many years, and um, you know, through my own journey and through working with clients, I see that. It's really not so much. I mean, tools are very important, but I see um, that changing the narrative or the self self narrative, I would say, um, has been. It's actually like the basics or like the foundation of any change that we mm -hmm. want to make, and that is easier said than done because yeah. we like to live in our stories, the mm -hmm. stories that we tell ourselves, and. We can, you know, we want to make change yet, you know, it's, there is a reason why, you know, we usually when we ask a person, what do you want, right? And tell me three things that you can do to make that happen. They know the answer. Like we know the answer. Yeah. Of course, the question is why you're not doing it, right? The implementation, like the, the knowing versus doing. Um, and I and I believe that the narrative uh, has it's like the foundation. It's like the basics of mm -hmm. change. Of you know, yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm here because I'm okay. just here to learn more. Great. I think everybody's checked in, so um, let's go and share the screen again. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so this is us, and um, I'm just going to share a couple of thoughts from the very beginning and then kind of walk you through what makes narrative coaching unique and what are some of its core elements, and then the last third will be about the program itself. Um, so I'll, I'll just let you read this for a minute and tell you why I'm starting here. Um,
Now, my first uh, degree was in sociology, and so I can't not take a <coughs> systems view of what's happening. Um, but in that, you know, studying anthropology, um, et cetera. Um, so the narrative coaching model actually is based on um, an anthropological piece on rites of passage. So it's a change model in many ways. We're tracking um, what we're observing about clients' stories as they're current telling, currently telling them, what they might want to do about that, and what a new story would kind of sound like, and then how they're going to bring that back to their world. And so for me, one of the things I love, I love about this work is it's very grounded in reality and how people actually live and talk and think and um, as opposed to trying to impose some artificial construct called coaching on a human experience or a human conversation. It doesn't mean that a lot of those traditional coaching skills are not useful. They are, but we're just going to start in a different place. And I find often in coaching, there's a lots of temptations to chase the bright and shiny. And people arguing over, well, my horse is better than your horse, but in reality, failing to grasp that all the horses are on, are on a carousel and are going nowhere. And so I feel like coaching is at this inflection point for a number of reasons. I've talked about this for a long time, but even now it feels even more so. And part of that is um, freeing us to bring more of our whole self to our work, freeing us from some of the, I think, outdated views of what coaching is supposed to be, to actually pursue, pursue mastery and maturity as a human being so we can help our clients uh, to do the same. My most common feedback in our programs, and if you're in this, you'll hear this from me time and time again, is please stop coaching. You're trying so hard to coach, you're missing the vast majority of what's right in front of you. It's noble and it's great, and I'm sure you're gonna that, that question you were thinking of asking is going to be a great one, but you're asking questions in the wrong direction because um, I don't sense the program, the conversation is actually going there. Um, and so... For me, you'll discover in the program about the first um, a third of the a quarter to a third of the program uh, is really just about you, because we want to understand what are you bringing to narrative coaching, what might you want to leave behind, what uh, what do you want to do with narrative coaching, who are you in that space, and a lot of it is we we just really believe that we can't uh, travel any farther than we've gone ourselves. It doesn't mean that we have to have had the exact same experience as our client. But we need to have felt that and we need to have had similar enough encounters. Um, you know, if you're talking to a client that just lost the their dream job and is devastated and grieving horribly and you've never dealt with grief in your life, you're not going to be very useful to them because you won't go. You either won't go to those places and you'll divert them or distract them so they don't go there or you'll try to go there but overwhelm yourself because you, you're now swamped with all of your own uh, anxieties or uh, concerns about grief. Um, and so I want to, you know, the important thing is who are we? We are going to be our best instrument as a narrative coach. And so we'll spend a lot of the um, of our time in the very beginning talking about that. This particular photo is one I took. It's in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. It's a place I'd been many times. About five years ago, I decided to go back again. I hadn't been there a long time to a place called Lake Italy, which is, as I knew it, a beautiful, pristine alpine lake beneath these huge granite uh, mountains and when I got about halfway up I shouldn't have I shouldn't have been able to take this picture because I was actually hiking from way down in that valley and I was supposed to be on the other side of that canyon but the trails were gone they were completely gone and so I'm trying to make my way up I'm trying to you know look at my map and I'm really good at maps and I'm just following it very stubbornly and then I end up in a place that I should never have been and you know it was really hard and um and then I get there and I said, and I realized I, the reason I was confused is not only is the trail gone, but I looked around and I realized climate change had wiped out all the glaciers. So there was no more water for the lake. And this extraordinarily beautiful place was now dry as a bone. And with it, the erosion and things changed. The tra trail was wiped away. Uh, and I, I, got, I learned my lesson and found it on the way back. But for me, it was just a great analogy about we get attached to our maps about how things are supposed to be. And a lot of what we're doing in narrative coaching is helping people realize the stories they made up about that, but then learn to let them go to see what they couldn't otherwise see. If I had just like stopped for a minute and did five minutes of centering or meditation, I would have realized this was futile and I would have um, looked for a plan B. But I said, no, I know it's going to be here. I, I recognize it. I can't wait to be there. I was so attached to that. 
So that was a, I was doubly disappointed. It wasn't there, and I nearly killed myself trying to get there anyways. <laughs> um, so again, note to self, just use it as an analogy so you can make fun of your own uh, dumbness. That's what I'm doing. Um, all right, so um, we're going to talk about what it makes it unique, what's it like to be a narrative coach, and then what's it like to be in the program. Um, so I always like to start with a little bit of humor. No, go back to what I was saying before. Um, this person is thinking that they're doing their job, uh, but in reality, they're sitting safely on the land in a tower. Meanwhile, the person's drowning. Um, and so a lot of our work is helping us get out of the tower, to stand with our clients, to be with them in whatever fashion would serve what they need most right then. So this is, these next two slides are the simplest way I can depict it. It kind of creates a caricature of coaching. So coaching is kind of more than this, but this is what I often observe. That most coaches are taught, your primary job is to you know, set an agenda, you know, set goals, ask great questions, help drive action, et cetera, et cetera. So in a traditional approach, your primary job is to ask questions. And a lot of coaches get very proud of their great questions. And it's good to have good questions. But what happens then is the client ends up thinking about our question. And then they're going to come up with an answer but to our, our question. We're going to listen to their answer, formulate what we think that means in our mind, and ask our next question. So that's bad enough in itself because this is a closed loop driven by your questions as the coach. But it gets worse because then we start getting so anxious of, oh my God, this is getting so complicated enough, so much more to remember that we're thinking more and more about what's the next thing I'm supposed to ask as opposed to what's actually happening uh, right in front of us. And so we pay too much attention to ourselves and we had too much worry about our methodology. So um, as Ursula was mentioning, I've been working on this paper and this big project with the Institute of Coaching at Harvard around uh, trying to transcend competency models. I've created a different, completely different approach. Um, but a part of that is based in the research, which would suggest that, um, that methodology has almost zero impact in terms of dif differences and outcomes. Any solid methodology done really well will get good outcomes. And, and so, and, and we are, are just slightly more um, uh, involved in outcomes as the coach, but in reality, um, those are not the key factors at all. The, um, the client is by far and away the greatest variable in outcomes. And then second is the relationship you built together. Um, and so I wanna, not only move away from this sort of inquiry-driven, coach-driven process, but I also want to draw our attention to what actually makes more of a difference. So the, where we put our attention in narrative coaching is our attention is largely on the field, and that includes us. That's the energetic space, the felt space, the sensory space, the talking space, the um, area in which we're working together, and then the relationship that we're forming in that space and that's holding the container of our conversation. That's where we spend the vast majority of our time. That space also includes the client themselves and ourself. Our primary first move, our primary job is to witness the client because they're the ones who are gonna take af actions after they leave the session. They're the ones that are gonna have the most impact on whether they are successful or not. And so we are decentering ourselves even farther by witnessing what's happening in the field as we're talking, what's happening to the client while they're telling their story. And our questions are not aimed back at us for us to understand and gather information. Our questions are directed to the client about their own experience. What are you noticing right now as you tell me that story about your boss? Do you, do you feel something? Do you sense something in your body? What comes up for you? Um, there are things that we can offer, like this is what I'm noticing about you, but our primary role is about their experience in the present moment. <clears throat> and then when they talk, they're narrating their experience and their meaning and sense of their experience, not trying to please us or to answer our questions, but to make sense and meaning of themselves. Uh, and then we're listening to that, but again, not to form some question. It does come up. We don't not do questions, but that's not our primary response. 
we're going to share what we're observing about what they shared with us. And that's what we're going to reflect back to them in terms of witnessing them. Um, and so for me, I'd like to give us a chance to practice that in just a minute. Um, you're going to need these questions. So I'm just going to put this up for a second. If you want to take a screenshot or use your camera, take this. You're going to need this in your breakout room. Uh, so that would be really helpful. But while people are getting that organized, are there any questions you have about what I just shared here? Any curiosities, any uh, viewpoints, anything you'd like to ask or share? All good? Can you repost that? Sorry, I just didn't take, had a chance to take a picture of it. David, the, the four things that you want us to talk about in right the... Um... Right, right there. Appreciate it. Got it. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to put you into pairs, and I'm just, we'll just do this one time for about 10 minutes. Uh, it doesn't matter how long I give you. you. Most people will complain I don't give you enough time because <laughs> you want more. So I'm just going to save you that agony. And just tell you, you won't have enough time because you won't keep talking and you're not going to be able to. Um, but this is really the only purpose of this is not the purpose of this is not to get an outcome for the person you're coaching. They might. That would be a bonus. My intent or my hope for this is you'll get a feel for what this is like to work this way. So the way that we're going to do this is one of you is going to be coached and you're just going to say something that you would want coaching on. And um, some people cheated this morning and added other questions. So I don't know. Um, Renegades, we like those. We get lots of them, but still, they could have followed my directions. Um, <laughs> but you're going to ask the other person one question after, when they get to a pausing point in their sharing about what's happening for them. And you're going to ask them, what are you noticing right now? Where's their attention? Where's their sensation? Do they have new emotions? Are new images coming up? Are they realizing something? And they're gonna pick something. They're gonna notice something and answer the question. Um, and so if you're the person being coached, keep it simple. Don't list a 27 things you're noticing. Pick one or maybe two. Um, and then you're gonna wait a second as the coach and you're gonna ask them, so what feels important to you about that? Um, and so you're sort of thinking of this as not like moving forward. You're, there's nothing you're trying to do here. There certainly is nowhere you're trying to go or get, you are right here now. So I think of it more or less as a like going across as more of a descent. You're descending into what does this conversation actually want to be about? Because our psyche, when we tell stories, are actually part of it is our ego talking. I want you to see me this way or see the situation this way. So I'm going to tell you that story. So you'll see how brave I am or how clever I am or how whatever I am. But there's also part of you that it doesn't buy that BS and wants to grow. And so it's going to put pieces into the story, like Freudian slips and funny characters and things like, what? why is that here? Well, that's there because that's the part of the person that doesn't buy the illusion that the first story was the whole one and wants to bring certain pieces out into the, into the center. So we're just going to move through these four questions. And I want you just to focus less on the words and notice what happens in yourself when you either ask or are asked these questions, okay? Right. Well, I'm getting the room set up. Are there any questions? There's a number. So we'll have a group of three. Uh, so um, I'll give you 12 minutes. No, I'll still give you 10. You have two people commenting. I want to just give you the experience. It doesn't really matter which side you're on. If you're in the group of three, you can have an observer, a coach, and someone being coached. If you're in a pair, just have the two people. All right. So I'll create those rooms. I'll give you 10 minutes. They're set. All right. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. There. I'm going to take that down and... Um, to see um, how your conversations went.
Not enough time. <laughs> right on cue. Well done. <laughs> I, I will say that I, I think that Helen, Helen was the the coach, and I was the client, and uh, Awa was the uh, observer. And uh, I think Helen asked some questions that, and then they both perceived some things as reactions that were very helpful. Okay. I, I really enjoyed my session with uh, Mila. Um, I, I learned a lot uh, huh? <laughs> in the area that she was being coached on. So that was uh, that was interesting to just okay. allow myself to be an observer to yeah her experience. <laughs> hmm. Now is it for you, Mila? It's it's strange being in the chair. I've not had a lot of experience being on the coach e side of it or the coach side of things. So it's a it's a novel experience but we got into some Jungian symbology that we were excellent. crossing on so excellent hmm. and what in, in, in what sense would you make of where you ended up um she was it, it, we we were able to kind of bridge between the intellectual component and the somatic components and okay. kind of ping back and forth between them and, and and see them as they interrelated to each other, which was very helpful. Okay. Hmm. And Eva or Helen, anything you want to add? I, I just found that the questions were, especially the very ones after you, you know, you know, what are you noticing right now? But then the next one, what feels important to you? I find that just really um, gives the coach, sorry, the, the coachee an opportunity to really kind of think about, well, what are they feeling? And, um, and sometimes I think if a coach isn't overly feeling themselves, then they're going to miss that whole part. Yeah. They're going to miss really the crux of it in many ways and um that's one and the other thing i noticed is in the last question um Ursel wasn't sure about what he wanted to do uh what are you feeling called to do he wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do so i just could instead of saying what is different as a result i just said if you were to choose one of your three scenarios mm -hmm. what would it what would it look like and mm -hmm. and just went from there but I really did like the questions. It, it, I just thought the depth of the conversation was yeah. co quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. and so um, we we don't um, we don't try to get anywhere in the conversation, and then we, therefore we go farther and faster because yeah. we're not trying so hard to try to guess where the conversation is going. And so I think of it less as asking things to move forward, which does happen, but not because we're asking questions, but but more a descent. Start with a relatively innocuous question. What are you noticing right now? It seems really elementary. And then pretty soon, like 10 minutes later, like, how did I get over here? Yeah. You just sat with what was it? Yeah, go ahead. And what I want to say is I think, like, uh, we talked a little bit also, when you ask someone what's noticing right now, or some them made the comment, he had thought about all these three separate things, but he never saw, thought of all three together. And, you know, mm. and it was really interesting for him to all of a sudden see it from a different point of view because he looked at it one way and it was like it came together all three to say so how am I going to handle all these three things and it was really interesting he was doing just a lot of you know thought and work and like okay so this is happening that's happening that's happening and I mean I don't like this and I like that but I don't really like that that whole thing and yeah. it was really interesting um cool yeah that's great one thing I'm noticing in retrospect as I hear you say that is in the course of our conversation, um, this is probably not the appropriate language, but I, I didn't break license, if if that makes any sense. Like there was there was never a point in time in the conversation where I popped out of the conversation to realize oh. that someone was asking me questions. You know, like when mm. you watch a movie and yeah. you're going along with the storyline and then something breaks the storyline and you pop out of it because you can't track yeah, with it anymore. It's illogical or doesn't make doesn't fit and yeah. 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 Hmm. No, and so uh, you'll see in a minute, but we do our best to stay in the story as much as possible. And I know some of the coaching schools, you know, talk about not not getting caught up in client stories, but that's all they have. Everything that client tells us is a story. 
And so I wanted to use it to our advantage rather than having to have them learn fancy coaching language or anything else, just talk to me. And I'll, I'll do the work of helping you understand your own story. Because um, the story provides um, 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 clues about how they're navigating their life, how they're identifying themselves, kind of what they really want, what they really think, what they really feel. Um, and so, the, like you said, the mixture of the somatic and sort of the symbolic and the literal all kind of come together actually quite quite well. Um, yeah, so let me just, um, I think it's a word. Um, <clears throat> I'll back here again. Um, let's go right here. There we go. So we did that, and um, so I, I think it's a funny picture, but I, I like to have a little humor in these things. So if I was the one, if I was the coach of the one on my left, my first job would be to see if I could get her to wear better shoes for carrying boulders. <laughs> <laughs> They're clearly the wrong shoes, um, <laughs> but um, you know you'll find. That, so I, there's nothing in the program that's asking you to give up anything or replace anything, it will augment and enrich how you coach. At the same time, pretty much every student finds out along the way that a whole bunch of stuff they thought was essential for the coaching is absolutely unnecessary. Um, that might be interesting to us, it might be fascinating or whatever, but it's really not that relevant to the client. So a lot of what we're doing in the very beginning of the program when we're learning about ourselves is putting down the rock. Uh, so we can actually just walk with our client um, and ultimately, we want to feel like the woman on the right, which is free, easy, breathing in fresh air. I like to believe that's over in Marin somewhere. I don't know, but because um, uh, I think I've been on the trail on my bike. But uh, yeah, that's how we want to feel. And so, whenever, like when I started coaching 25 years ago, I would do like two clients and be exhausted and need a nap because I was working so hard to do a great job in a field that didn't really even exist yet uh, in many ways. And now I can train all day. I run three-day retreats. I can coach all day. And you know, I'm tired from being on my feet a lot or, you know, kind of, but, but mentally and emotionally, I'm completely relaxed because I'm no longer efforting to carry the conversations. And so I just find these days with the level of things people are bringing to sessions, the more ease and grace we can bring, the more effective we're going to be. Um, and so one of the ways we think about that, to so use another analogy, is that of a tugboat. This is my very first analogy to describe narrative coaching. So, you know, if imagine a person, you know, an adult, you've got a 50-year-old person who's a leader, you're coaching them, and um, they're a giant boat. What you're coaching them on, they've probably struggled in one way or another their entire life. And so it's naive and unrealistic to expect that in a few sessions we can completely transform a lifelong habit or behavior. So I think of it more of this person that we're coaching was changing before we got there. They're gonna be changing after we they're done with us. And so we're just interested, where can I nudge them right now? Where can I interact with them right now that's gonna bring the next steps of clarity or insight or action to bear on this larger journey they're on called their life? Um, and so tugboats can do this because they have the captain has a very deep understanding of physics and where to push. They have very deep, low motors. And so they can get bridges down in there, push these ships that are significantly bigger than they are. And so it's an analogy I find quite helpful in thinking about what we're doing. Um, so if I just, um, the next page has, it's, if you've read the book, you'll recognize this page, but um, so these are the six principles of narrative coaching. And the first three have to do with your stance as a coach. The first one, if you don't remember any of the other ones, remember the first one, it's the most important one. It's a go-to strategy. Like if you get lost in a session or you drift off and you forgot what the client's talking about, right? All I have to do is come back to center and say, what, what is they talking about now? What's right in front of me? Um, and we find that that keeps the co co coach from, oh, what should I be asking? What are they saying? What? Why are they doing this? And then you've lost the thread altogether. And if we just stay present to what's in front of us and trust that, then it's more than enough. We work really hard, especially at the beginning of a session. We don't set agendas or goals or anything. We just want to be present to the person as much as we can without judgment. And part of our job into inviting them into coaching is how willing are they to be honest about what is? 
And so, you know, the, the what is, the situate, which is the first leg of our model, could take five minutes and it could take two sessions. That, but I want to know what can I do to help them feel more relaxed, more safe, more generative here. And a lot of that comes from me not judging them right? and uh, encouraging them not to judge themselves. And then the third one comes sort of a derivative of Ram Dass's famous line, but I think of it as uh, speaking only when we can improve on silence. And it's not nearly as often as we think. And so if you were to watch me coach, um, I, tell you, I used to travel a lot around the world and teach for like graduate coaching programs and demo this, there people were very confused. They would say like, you were just sitting there, but then you had an amazing conversation. And we learned something about the client in five minutes that I haven't learned all semester with them. How did that happen? You didn't do anything. I said, I'm not being hard to do things. I'm being hard to support my client. Exactly. And, and making space and making safety and making and allowing silence to just do its own magic is often um, the most important thing they can do. The other three are more about um, our stance with clients. So we talk about focusing on generating experiences, not explanations. So if you have a, um, um, this explains part why we don't set goals very often. Because if the client can't do it with do it while they're in the session with us, the odds of them doing it later are pretty small. Because the pressure will be too great and they won't be. Um, and, and so way to think about this is that if you've got a client, um, maybe they're, they've got their first manager job or their first leader job and they're discovering some things that they maybe didn't learn well enough or they don't have enough confidence around. And so they might say, you know, I have a hard time just speaking up and say what I want or to give, you know, really clear feedback. I, I'm still too wishy-washy or I go all technical. And um, well, you know, so I'm not interested in like, well, here's a three books you could read and here's an explanation of why you're doing that. And here's an explanation of how you could change that. And explanations are weak because just like willpower is often weak because um, they're all in our heads. Um, and so we want to create experiences. So if somebody says, yeah, I just need to be more assertive as a new leader. Great. So I'd like you to be assertive right now. So what name one thing that you'd like me to do differently to make your coaching better for you? <laughs> what? And all, the, all, their, all their defenses come up, all their barriers come up, all their self-judgments uh, come up. Great. So tell me about them. And, uh, well, you're not going to like me. And, oh. you know, and uh, I don't know if I should say this or I've never had much coaching, so I'm not even sure it's right to explain. They'll come up with a thousand excuses as opposed to, no, it's fine. Whatever you say is fine. Or I might say, um, uh, they might actually begin to venture and say some things that might feel more leaderly. And then I say, great. Now stand on top of the chair over there and say that again. Now stand on the chair and raise your voice twice as loud as it is now. All because, we it's not because any of these are the desired outcome. We don't even know what the desired outcome is. I'm trying to bring parts of the self uh, possibilities for the self, experiments of what's possible, allowing them to, like, for example, to feel energized. Like, where do you draw power from when you're talking? If you're trying to give commands like this and then you're wondering why nobody's following you, right? Your your body's completely checked out of the conversation. So, well, I want you to experience your whole self. Um, and uh, so we, we do that a lot. We create a lot of improvisational uh, what we call serious play, we give people a lot of direct experiences of the very thing they say they want. Um, so in the safety of a coaching session, they can try it on for size. We work directly with the narrative elements in the field, which means we don't ask a lot of our own psychological or coaching questions. We only work as much as we can with what actually shows up in the story or could show up in the story that they're telling you. And we work directly with that in real time. We don't analyze it or try to figure it out, we just work with it. So we work a lot with metaphors and things. And then lastly, we use the concept for actual passage of thresholds. These are big points of change or choice for the person, which often comes out of coaching as people realize, oh, I need to quit my job or um, or I've been, I've been doing this, I've been doing X and now I need to do Y and, and not go back and do X so much. So we need to be able to identify and show up for clients when they get in those spaces. Okay, so just two more, and then I'm going to stop and see what questions you have before we um, dive in and talk about the program itself. And if, you, and if you have any questions as we go in these next two slides, just feel free to put it in the chat box and I'll pick it up. All right, so 
I'll let you read this. Just give me a break from my voice and see what you think. So silence is often thought of as that thing we do after we stop talking. It sort of diminishes the value of silence. And my observation is most all of the cool things that come out of coaching come out of waiting for silence, not from talking. Um, and so we're trying to help ourselves and our client pay more and closer attention to what's actually going on. We're letting the silence sort of speak to us, like what is the emotion of this silence? Is it tension? Is it sadness? Is it fear? Is it whatever? And so we can actually feel the space that we're actually in um, to be able to get more clarity about what we're actually doing there. So it's we always start, as I said, witnessing, and we start by listening, not by talking. We, we do a lot of uh, physical activities in our retreats. I've actually done those. The three chairs is my most famous one. I've actually done that with people whose language I don't speak. I have no idea what they're telling me, and I don't need to know. I just watch their face. I watch their body. I watch their sort of set judgments of themselves. And they need to know enough English so I can ask them questions or offer reflections. But I, I mostly just wait. And I often am in silence until they figure out what they want to say. And then we go from there. Um, and then the last piece, which sort of explains this philosophy, is this one. I'm going to make one comment about that, and then I'll stop and see what questions you have. <clears throat> well, one of the things, one of my areas of expertise in the coaching space is working with attachment theory, um, which helps me understand the nature and the patterns in client relationships. One of the languages that comes in attachment theory is what are called moments of meeting, which we'll talk about in class when you get there, but um, it really is about um, a lot of what we're doing through the coaching relationship and through our focus on the client is helping create this space for them to develop themselves. And so part of that is sometimes that we're modeling that, we're sort of showing them how it can be done, um, but often it's by putting ourselves aside and helping them to heal themselves. But in that, what often these come at points of disruption where you're kind of going along and maybe in a kind of a casual session or maybe more sort of like cognitive session. And then the client says, oh, by the way, my son just dropped out of college or something comes in. Oh, wow, okay, here we go. Well, so we, I observe coaches having this belief. I'm objective. I'm outside of this. I should just sit here and let them do the work or I'll, I'll, get, I'll lob questions over the wall to them. But in reality, just like if you were, if you've been a parent, you know, one of the frustrating things about being a parent is when, just when you think you've got it figured out, they change and you're, they, they're on to your strategies, right? They've figured you out and they actually get better at your own game than you are. Um, and so the same is true in coaching that um, uh, a lot of the most significant breakthroughs for our clients come because we were willing to enter the game ourselves and change ourselves. Um, and I, um, yeah, I'll share some examples of that. But so part of this whole idea is like we are a wounded healer ourselves. We're not standing out here as some perfect person with everything figured out and we, you know, sort of like try to wave our fairy wand to make them better. We're another human. And so part of it is like, you know, I've had clients yell at me because that was important for them as part of their development. I don't take it personally, but that's what they need to do. But it does kind of sting at first because you it's really hard not to take it personally. But then I, I must, I'd encourage that because they need to hear themselves yell. Not because I'm encouraging yelling as a strategy, but because by boxing up all their strong emotions, they're they're both killing themselves and being really ineffective. Um, and so we're trying to find ways to help people show up. And that often means we have to show up at a higher level as well. Um, all right. So I'm going to stop there because the next few slides are about the program itself. 
But I wanted to see what comes up for you in these last few slides, anything you'd like to share or ask about. David, when you talked about encouraging that person to yell, yeah. you, um, how did you do that? Did you yell yourself or did you say, why don't you try yelling? Like, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I, no, I don't need to yell, but I would just, so it would, as an example, you have somebody that um, just really lacks confidence when they get in front of groups. Okay. So I might say, okay, imagine there's a group of us here. How would you talk to us? And I have them just talk to us normally. No judgment, no trying to shame them or judge them or change anything. Just talk, you know, it's often they're very mild mannered or they come from a culture where speaking up or a gender where speaking up is not supported. So again, I'm not saying you, to get ahead in the world, you should yell because we have yeah. plenty of yelling. Yeah. <laughs> But if you've never, if you have no physiological reference in your body of being full voiced in singing or in sport or in playing the trumpet or in raising your voice, then it, when it comes time to need that, you can't find it. You don't have it. Yeah. Okay. You don't have yeah. it in you. And, and even your physiology doesn't want, you'll hurt your voice, you'll hurt your throat because your throat's not used to opening up. You're like always talking like this, really constricting. And so I might I might invite them. So say what you say that sentence you just said your normal way and make it uh maybe 50% louder. Okay, yeah. No, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So it's like to me, it's like someone teaching someone to teach in front of a class. It's like, oh, get up on the chair, see what it's like. And it's just you and I here. So let her rip kind of deal. Yeah. And they're like, oh my God, I have a voice. It's like you do. <laughs> exactly. So okay. I'm, I've always been a big Monty F Python fan. And one of my favorite classic um, episodes is the Ministry of Silly Walks. And so we want to have fun with them because we want them to loosen up and try some new things just to kind of feel you have way more latitude than you might realize. Yeah. And, and we have to be, you know, we, we take, we are socially conscious coaches in the narrative space. So we're not going to, you know, try to coerce or encourage somebody to do something that would not be safe for them. Right. You know, and um, uh, we uh, we had this really interesting, uh, one of my clients, um, I'm doing a lot of work with their leadership development team. They, it's a very large company and they, they do all the programs and they're, they're really growing during the pandemic. And so they're hiring a lot of new people. And most of the original team were middle to, you know, older middle-aged white women. And they started, you know, in a really smart way, because a lot of the other part of the organization were not, of hiring people from a variety of backgrounds. And many of whom were a lot younger than they kind of starting out in their HR kind of LND career. And we got they got we were talking about the plans and how they wanted to grow and all these things. They got really excited about some of what they were taking from my 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 framing about things they could go, go do to get more visibility and credibility in the organization. And then there's this really wonderful younger African-American woman. So, well, this is really great, but I don't have any status here. I'm a different skin color than the rest of you, right? I'm new at this myself. I'm not totally confident yet. So it's great that you guys can do this, but you're asking all of us to do this. And that would be, I believe, detrimental to my career and my happiness. If I tried, you have the social capital to do that and the status that I don't. Well, that was shocking to the, the women on the team. I'm not, I'm not sure why they didn't realize this, but they didn't. But what I really admired about them, they said, ah, so we're realizing now that rather than racing ahead with all these new things that's going to leave some of our own team behind, we're going to turn backwards. And what they did on the spot was co-design a mentoring program for these young employees who had often were out on their own being asked to figure this out, like how to drive a train while the train's already going 100 miles an hour. Uh, and so it was a, a really powerful turnaround, uh, I, I thought. Um, and then a lot of the things that they were moving towards involved more technology, reaching more kinds of audiences around which the newer people knew more than they did. So then we just did some reverse mentoring where they could help each other. And then they started forming a team as opposed to a collection of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Other thoughts or um, questions at this point? I do have one question. You can have as many as you I want. Do, 
<laughs> You're not limited to only one. <laughs> I do. I'm, I'm in public relations. So the bulk of my work is pure consulting work. Mm-hmm. And I know that in the, the ICF framework, what I do is not really considered coaching at all. It's, it's purely considered consulting. Um, but in the course of what I need to do, uh, I need to make sure that people get to an authentic version of their story because we can't take the version of we can't take a story out that is not vetted for being authentic because it will crumble yeah. as soon as yeah. we take it forward. Sure. Um, how do you understand and how do you how do you see the relationship between consulting work and coaching work? I also know that you know a couple of the people um, that I've seen uh, affiliated with you and and on other sessions. Um, are also consultants. So I know it's something that's come up for you. Yeah. Um, it's, there's a lot of things I could say there. So I, I've most of my work in the coaching space has been as a writer, a thinker, and a teacher. Um, I've taught, a, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people coaching skills, like an organization. So I find it a really great way to support people to have the conversations around significant change projects that I've done. Um, and I, I, the ID way way program, which is our other program, um, kind of grew out of those projects where I was allowed to just be myself. So I could be talking to the governor of the state. I could be talking to a group of people building servers in the basement. I could be looking with frontline staff with uh, high level executives, um, in the service of what they were trying to achieve in the process, always using a coaching strategy or approach. So I look at this as, you know, being, having integrity and clarity up front about offering how you, what you do, what you can bring to your client. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I don't, I've given a lot of time and energy to ICF, but I don't have, their set of competencies don't mean anything to me. It, it feels like a tiny little box. You can't coach in a tiny little box. It's useful. It's very useful for beginners who don't know which way is up. And want to know, know the basic requirements to be a coach. But I think about this in terms of like one of the reasons that um, I, 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 I started when I started combining um, organizational development and training and coaching into one practice. Because when I was just consulting, I wasn't paying enough attention to adoption of what we were doing and the stories in play and the challenges around that or the honest conversations that they weren't having. And for which they needed coaching. But then I would do coaching, but then they wouldn't do anything because the system wasn't working. And this and there was too many complexities around them. And so I found that like I felt like a little, you know, the you know, sort of apocryphal story of the little Dutch boy running around putting his fi- I was always putting my finger in holes in the dike, which was exhausting and did not very effective. So I thought, what if we could do all this at the same time? Which is what the ID way became became. So I, I believe that when you were um, I don't know what the scenarios are that you get called in for, but there's a human component, individual component about them doing something, noticing something, feeling something, being clear about why they wrote that in their story. Um, but there's also a, an advisory almost or consulting piece about, well, that may be tr- true for you, but this is how I'm hearing this. And therefore, if I'm hearing it like this, you can imagine the audience is going to hear it like this. So you might want to rethink that. Um, and so I look at it as you have a human being with a complex problem. C- clients never come with a problem in a single box. So why do we delude ourselves to believe that one uh, one thing we could do is going to s- address all of that? Um, my first career was as a grief counselor uh, and a hospital chaplain. So I'm really, really good at grief. And I've worked on ma- many large scale change projects that never talked about grief. And so I, that's what I brought because uh, that's what the project was missing. So I'm th- like, for you, I just think the narrative coaching is great because it traffics in stories. It works with identities, which is the core as a storyteller. <clears throat> it helps people hear themselves, feel themselves, notice themselves, so they can try out things before they go public with something. And in that, you know a lot about what you're doing. So it will be, in my view, not right to withhold something that would be really valuable to them that they might never discover by themselves. And so in the, some of the ID work we bring into this, we talk a lot about scaffolding. So if 
your clients needing to say something that wouldn't they wouldn't normally say in a story, you're going to have to help them build a bridge, a scaffolding to like, I could never say that. I know. So we're going to help you develop yourself so you could be somebody, you could become somebody who could say that. And that that underpinning scaffolding has to happen. You can't just consult on that. They've got to feel that. They've got to walk that path. Um, yeah. And so I think, I mean, I think the coaching as a meta, meta skill is essential for anything we do anymore to get buy-in, to get support, to give people the resources they need to go do whatever it is they want to do. I don't think any profession by its own any silo by its own is going to is going to make it very much longer because it's just, the world is not like that anymore. Yeah, probably more than you wanted my love, but there you go. <laughs> I've thought about these things for a long time, so sometimes I have to kind of like really manage myself to try to trim my answers. I don't always do very well, but so be it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I shall show you what we're what we're gonna do in the program. Okay. So here's the, here's the structure. This will be the last year we teach these programs like this. So we're changing a lot of the formats. Um, so I have more time to write. Um, but um, the program is nine modules over nine months. There's a little bit of a gap in the middle. Just give yourself a little breather. Um, every module has not, uh, four sessions. Uh, 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 sessions. Um, the first one is with me. It's what we think of as initiation. It's introducing the core ideas and material for that particular module's topic. That'll be live with me. Um, that we do all of these twice a day at 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. Pacific time or 10 p.m., 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. in the East Coast of the U.S. Um, and they're all recorded, so you can always go back and listen to them again or listen if you miss the session. You can also download the recording if you on um, the the slides and stuff from the website uh, for the group. The second week is what we think of as immersion. So normally this might be in the other programs, more stuff, but we don't want to give you more stuff. We're going to give you two assignments and uh, one's a stretch assignment, which is usually kind of a personal reflection, often quite somatic uh, to kind of learn about yourself and experience some of the work for yourself privately and then write about it. And then this field assignments are going to try something. And, um, the example I gave this morning was, was a fun one, so I'll do this again. Um, I had a long, long distance relationship for a long time with a woman from Amsterdam uh, who had taken my program at one point. And um, we were, uh, she was out visiting when I was living in California for a while after Australia. Um, and we were driving up uh, uh, up towards Sacramento, which would mean something to Myla, uh, from the Bay Area um, and to my step, stepfather's funeral. And my mom's second husband had passed away it was a some ungodly hour of the morning, you know, already there was too much traffic, already were people in a bad mood. And so we decided to stop, take a break and um, get a coffee. So we pulled into a Starbucks and we walked inside and there was a pretty long queue. And I said, well, this is rush hour and there's only two people here. And it was these two young women and um, and you could tell they were completely overwhelmed. They were like half the people hadn't showed up. It was right after the pandemic kind of opened back up, but there's still no employees. <laughs> and so they were doing basically four people's jobs and they're totally stressed and people were barking at them, where's my coffee, where's my coffee? And um, and so uh, I turned to my partner and I said, well, you remember that, that assignment we had in class was, was to try something new you wouldn't normally do. So let's do that now. So what, and she goes, what, what should we do? And I said, I don't know. Well, what do, you, what, do, what do we need here? Well, more joy, these people are like really bent out of shape about nothing. It's, um, what, would, what would bring joy? Uh, I don't know. I, I like singing when I feel happy. Great. Let's see if we can get the clerks to sing. So we, when we got up to the counter, we, we talked to them and I said, do you like music? Yeah, we love music. They were, they were friends. What kind of music do you like? Well, we go to a gospel church. And so we like gospel music. Great. What's your favorite gospel song? And they told us, well, well, I think you should just like, the thing are getting really tense out here. People are getting really immature. I think we should just sing. And so they, they just stopped. They, they turned the back, one turned the back on the drive up window and one turned the back on the audience and they just sang for like 30 seconds. It was magical. And then all the ice was broken. People had sort of glaring at the one guy that was being a, a doofus and yelling at them. Um, the, uh, their, their whole mood lifted because like, wow, 
we can have a minute that's just for us to be happy. And we're not going to buy into this crap from these people in the line that can't be patient for us. And so and it was really wonderful to watch my, my partner was beaming because it was very kind of out of the box for her to like really, she's, uh, yeah, well, it's, to do something that un unusual, but it was, the, it was, it was amazing. And it was really fitting to, to uh, on the way to a funeral as well. So the field assignments are for you to go try something that's uh, central to the topic for that module. They're to do on your own. They're often to do at home or out when you're out and about. Um, sometimes you can try them in coaching sessions, but you don't have to. You can just try it in the comfort of your own home or whatever. And it's just to kind of get a feel for that module in yourself. So that as you're processing it, you've got anchors for it in yourself. Implementation session, you'll come back uh, most of the time, sometimes with me, but most of the time with one of our two faculty members. Um, and these are... Um, opportunities for you to practice some of the skills that go with that module. I used to do these, which I enjoyed because they were kind of fun getting people to practice. But what we found is I've been doing this for a long time. This work is in my bones. I couldn't do an ICF session if you paid me. I wouldn't even know. I, I think my body would just fall apart. I, I would have no idea. <laughs> I'd go into anaphylactic shock or something. And so I, when we started to realize that when people ask questions of me in these sessions about implementing this, I was forgetting what it's like to be a beginner. And so I realized the faculty is much closer to the students. They're only in this for three or four years. So they're much more remembering of what it's like to not know or to not have a coach this way. Um, and so we found they were just more effective in giving support. And then the last one, we will divide you up into groups of like around four in by time zones. And we'll give you a practice there. And like all the practices, you can do them, not do them. You can adapt them. Uh, I have no attachment. They're ones I've designed, but you might have something that fits your group better. And this is a chance for you to practice and get feedback um, in, the, um, in a really sort of structured way. And the benefit of this, what, which is why you're lucky if you're going to be in the program this year, is we have this partner who has an online platform that we're using for all of our integration sessions, which allow you to record yourself uh, doing the practice. And you won't be able to, um, it will, it'll be processed, and it takes a while for it to process. If you did it at the very start, you might have it available at the very end. And if not, you could either set up another time or watch it yourself. But there's a way for your partner to give you feedback on it, uh, on the transcript, on the video. It's an extraordinary piece to see how do you actually coach, not how you think you coach, but what do you actually do? And then we're, they're using a lot of my work. I'm an advisor to their company now, and um, they're using a lot of our work in narrative coaching and ID to really help people optimize um, what they're trying to do in the platform to improve themselves. So, uh, and we've. Uh, it might be that, for example, you you rush right in after a client has stopped talking. And so we might notice that and say, hey, you know, what it would be like to pause more? Well, how would I do that? Well, let's just go back and look at the video and see what you did when you didn't pause. And they might go, oh, wow. As soon as they were done, I, you took in a big gulp of air. So now I can talk. I've been waiting to say these things. And now I can talk because they've stopped talking. And so we might, you can use the platform now to say, well, what is the opposite of that? Well, what if I, when they stopped talking, rather than trying to use willpower, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk, which doesn't work. What if you just like started practicing exhaling when the person stopped talking? Ah. Well, already you've gained five seconds of silence. And then in the in the sighing or the pausing, you go, oh, that's pretty amazing. And you're already processing yourself. You don't need to talk. You don't need to push the conversation ahead. So these practices on the platform will give you a lot more data to work with to actually improve based on the feedback in your pod practices. Okay? So David, um, is the, one quick question. Is the pod the same throughout the whole nine months? Same yes. group of people? Okay. Yeah, every now and then you get a pod that doesn't quite work for whatever reason, schedules is usually the biggest problem. We're always happy to help facilitate moving a few people around, but um, we try to keep them as close to time zone as we can. We think just because of where the world is at the moment, we suspect that this cohort will be smaller than normal. Um, so we might have to kind of adjust a few people time zone wise because they're spread out all over the place. 
Um, but um, yeah, oops, um, wrong way. Um, so the, fir the first three modules are about you, mostly, uh, and about the mindset of an era of coach and how that might be different than the mindset you might think about from coaching. Um, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of good time with that. Um, the second one's more about the coaching partner of coaching process itself. And it goes back, it really maps to that diagram we showed you about serving as a witness and how to work with narrative material and stories in real time. And, um, and then the last three are about three very specific narrative coaching skills. Some of that you'll recognize from other coaching programs and some of it's quite unique. Um, uh, if you think about, uh, if you go back to the picture of a traditional approach, a lot of your questions are to draw information towards you so you can understand and ask your next question. In narrative coaching, we don't inquire about things. We inquire, uh, inquire into them. What are you noticing about that right now? When you think about that person, what comes up for you? Um, what happens to your hand if you imagine that person was sitting in it? <laughs> oh, well, hmm, that might be worth, worth talking about. <laughs> or you might go, oh, my God. Also, you have some emotions around this person. And so uh, we teach you about all those things. And we have a really fun way of doing our graduations. Um, so in the um, in the overall thing you would get in Circle, which is the platform you use, you have all these things. Like I said, all the recordings. Um, you have some bonus resources. We have a really wonderful um, forum that has been was really robust this time of people sharing and supporting each other in that forum. and. Um, yeah, yes. And then all the things there that are listed on the piece. And then we're, uh, Ovita is the platform we're using. So uh, for this program, and we have uh, practice groups for graduates. So after you're done, you can come and work on Ovita extensively and really drill down on where do you want to improve your conversations. Um, we're rebuilding the advanced certification program to make it a bit more robust to use the platform more. Um, and so that'll be ready probably in the spring. Um, and then we're, we've been asked a lot to find better ways to help narrative coaches find each other. So we're working on that. Um, all right. Um, if you want to come join us, or some of you already have, but are, um, if you do, um, I would highly suggest you just click on this link. I'm going to take this off um, this view. Up. I can put it in the chat box so you can just scrape it and use it. This will allow you, um, at the top of the page, will allow you to um, uh, allow you to um, get a discount on the program. We also have a cool uh, program where if you have a friend who wants to come join you, we'll give you a coupon there too. And they get $200 off the program as well, regardless of when they sign up. Um, so that's another cool thing. We often end up with a lot of friends in the program that way. There we go. Here's the... Link, oh, that's the MI Connect one, sorry. I was grabbing the wrong one. That's if you just have basic questions or you want to talk to me, you can set up an appointment that way. There we go. All right. I'm going to take this down. And so we just have about another 10 minutes. I just want to see if you have any impressions, any questions, any thoughts you have at this point. I have a question about the ID program I'm on. I, I think I'm on tomorrow for a little bit, but not towards the end. But I, I'll just wait to see if there's other questions about the narrative coaching. Uh, say that again, Ella. I didn't quite try. Oh, sorry. That. I have a few questions about the ID program because I can't um, stay for the end of it tomorrow. Oh, got it. I got yeah, well. But I, I don't want to take up someone else may have something on the NC program for narrative okay. coaching. So if you don't mind, Helen, um, I, I can stay on after the other people leave if they get their narrative okay. coaching questions. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we can just get it done now. Yeah. But are there any narrative coaching questions you might have? On logistics, what is the timetable for uh, introductions and preparations? And um, what do we need to know to, to begin or prep? Yeah. So the, most of it's on the website, but it starts in the middle of January, runs for nine months, it ends usually around the Last, latter part of September, we have graduation in early October. Um, 
And you'll have, once you sign up, you'll have access to a, a resource center and a, and a forum and a space for our class where all, everything will be stored, which you'll have 24 seven access to. Um, all the recordings end up on YouTube and a private channel just for the students. Um, and um, and then we usually have a module zero, um, which is use, we, we, now we've kind of moved to, to just recording them and posting them rather than having to get everybody together right after Christmas. So it'll have all the logistics about where things are. And we've moved a lot of that onto the, um, onto the website. So that now it's all digital, but it's just like, you know, when we meet and what you need to do and how much you need to show up to get your certificate and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, but, but mostly it just like, so I've, I've designed every program for the last 25 years, regardless of what I'm doing, using the narrative coaching framework, because it's actually fundamentally a change model. And if you think you're doing a training on customer service or whatever, people are coming in with one story about themselves and one story about what a customer service person does and one level of maturity, one level of understanding of what they're supposed to do. You put them through the training and think if you've done well, they'll come out the other side, seeing customer service differently, seeing themselves differently. Um, so in that we've designed um, all of this so that in those first three modules, we're just welcoming you. We're not trying to teach you anything really yet or show you anything or change anything. Um, uh, and um, so, Kimmy, I see your note, Kimmy. Um, I, and I can see, on, well, it's late for you, but I can see on, and answer any question you might have about those if you don't want to stay up for, um, but there, there are, there's another round of, um, of immersion sessions on the practice groups, okay? Yeah. Um, what was I saying? Um, what was I saying? Um, I don't remember. Um, Something about what you do with all of your sessions that or groups that you set up. I feel responsible. <laughs> and I'm not helping. Okay, I'll be quiet. No, no worries. It's all fine. That doesn't matter. If it's important, I'll come back around. Um, but um, yeah. So we try to focus on you in the beginning and we, we have a module zero, that's right. We have a module zero that has all the details. And if you have any questions, you can either email our team at MI Connect or just post it in the forum and I or somebody will answer it. Um, but that's just uh, basically an orientation to the program. Yeah. Anything else for now? All right. Well, I think I'll just, uh, all, all of you came for narrative coaching or something related to narrative coaching uh, to um, sign off if you would like. And then I'll stay on for a few minutes and see what's on Helen's mind about ID. Okay. Be well. And and the um, the practice group sessions will also be recorded. Kimmy, if you can't make them, you can always um, watch them. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Good. Right. Love to meet you all. Thanks. Thanks, Arsel and Eva. There we go. Somebody want to hear parts of it? Yeah, no, I think um, he was on twice because he was on a, had two things happening. So what I might do is I'm going to um, see if I can. There we go. I'm going to move him in the, to the waiting room so that at least he's not on our screen. <laughs> um, so what like to know? First of all, I want to say I was really, really impressed with your today. It was really very impressive. Um, I did your narrative coaching back in 2018. I recognize your name from that back yeah. in the LW Bex days. Yeah. But you know what? Yeah, but I didn't do, I didn't follow throughout the whole thing. I just, I was juggling way too many things yeah, okay. in my life. Way sure. too many things. So was I. <laughs> I remember that time. Yeah, so I actually, I got rid of some of your notes because I printed a whole bunch and I thought, I don't know if I don't want to go back. I think it's better just to go forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the program's thing. evolved a lot. Now that I'm free of um, uh, WBEX, the program's evolved a lot. It's a way, I think it's an even better program by far. Okay. Uh, that, okay. Yeah. That's kind of what I thought. And I, I do have your narr narrative coaching book still. Okay. Great. That's good. So the ID program, what comes up for me when I look a little bit, it's more, is it more self-development? Well, it's an interesting, uh, and we'll do it one more in this current form, then we, we'll, everything will change in 2025. But 
It started when I um, was doing all these big change projects. I was teaching narrative coaching uh, to in, in organizations, mostly in healthcare and the public sector. Um, and then they kept saying, well, can you teach this to all of us? Or can you link change to the coaching? And I said, well, yeah, I can, but that's me doing that. I, just not, I don't have a, a model or a, anything for that. Um, but I was doing that instinctively and figuring out a whole bunch of things. And then there was a woman that saw me speak at a conference and she said, we'd love to have you come and teach your coaching work to our people. They, they ran a large program working with disabled children. And so she told me what she wanted. And, and I said, well, it's really interesting. I'd love to work with you, but I'm not going to do that. She says, what do you mean? <laughs> no, consultants never turn down work. Like, what is that? And he, <laughs> I said, because I don't, I'm pretty much certain it won't give you what you want. Because trainings don't give people what they really want in the end most of the time. And she said, well, what should we do instead? And I said, I don't know, but I'll come, I'll call you in the morning. So I went home that night and invented integrative development. And all I did was to, I, I mapped out all of, there are probably about a dozen, some pretty significant health um, projects. Um, and I said, which ones really worked? So I just took the exemplars and left the average ones aside. And I said, what was I doing and what was different about them? And make a long story short, it was, again, freedom to be myself in Rome, freedom to draw on whatever I, I needed to address, what, whatever was in front of me. And so I went back to her and I said, I don't have a name for this, but here's all the pieces I would bring. She says, great, let's have that. And um, so I spent two years with them and... Um, they were able to become so much more effective that the state actually changed its policies to say to everybody, you need to do what they're doing because they're like way better than the rest of you now. Um, and it was all, I didn't teach them any of that. I just found ways for them to be in conversation with each other. With each other, yeah. But, yeah, so I, I de started as basically an integration of, like I said, OD training and coaching. Okay. But then I said it to do that, we can't do any of them in their traditional manners. Otherwise, you're just further entrenching bad bad habits. Yeah. So I said we need I need a different pedagogy. Well, uh, in my both in my PhD and in my all my degrees, I kept running into Paulo Freire. We our daughter was in Montessori schools, and I said we know as human creatures how to learn. We just got that beaten out of us going to school. And um, and so it really is an instinctive return to our capacity to learn. It draws on a lot of people like Moshe, Moshe Feldenkrais. I don't know if that's familiar to you at all, but he's a body worker, German physicist um, during the war, um, injured his leg, rehab. They told me he'd never walk again. He said, I'm an engineer, I can fix anything. Yeah. And he went back to, and he also had a very deep spiritual life as a, um, and he was able to basically do micro movements with full attention to basically reprogram his, take his body all the way back to being an infant. So like his first months of rehab was crawling as a baby, doing natural baby movements and rewiring his brain and his body to learn how to walk again, which he did. And he walked. Um, so we use him a lot because in ID, it's we want to, and we have a core model we teach to help a practitioner recognize what is the opening for learning right now. And so we borrow Lev Vygotsky's notion of zones of proximal development. And we say, what is something that this person could do if they had just that one last piece of support? Um, and, and, so, and, and, and it can be simple things. So you think about you know, you have a high school son, you know, and he's going on to his first prom. He's never pinned a flower on a girl before. He's afraid of stabbing her or <laughs> deflating yep. her or something. And they're so nervous and they're so awkward. And and so this the last piece, they you know, they know they know how to hold a pin, they know how to, but they don't know how to do it on a girl, right? And, and under the, the duress of, oh, we're here. So yeah, yep. so the scaffolding they might need is you might offer your jacket and say, do do me first, practice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. So they get over. Oh wow, this isn't as hard as it looks, you know. I, and I don't. I don't have to be like nonchalant. I can actually concentrate and try to do a good job so I can impress my date. 
Yeah, and um, if they're going to poke poke you, it's better than poking their date. <laughs> exactly. You're a lot more likely to forgive them. <laughs> I still love you. <laughs> and you still love them, and you won't be telling stories about them at school like their girlfriend would be or their boyfriend or whatever they forgot if yeah. you poke them. At, oh, you won't believe what my date did. Um, I was bleeding in my dress, my white dress or my white tux got all messy from the blood from being stabbed by my date. <laughs> It'll be all over social media. <laughs> of course it would. It'd be on TikTok and by tomorrow. Um, but no, anyways, so, um, we, um, we, so, uh, we created this model where, um, we, uh, we get groups to observe themselves and then we give them some, uh, we teach them a little bit of ethnography, mindfulness, coaching mindset. And so they start seeing different things in what they're observing. And then we, um, have them talk to each other about what they saw, and and you will you will be both a, a visitor, observer, and a participant because you'll go watch some and they'll come watch you. Yeah. And, but then there, there's no judgment. There's no trying to change anything. What did you notice? Oh wow, we talk about being family centric, but we do all the talking. Oh, we talk about being friendly, but we have an eighty page document we hand our families. <laughs> oh well, hmm. And um, without going into too much deal, uh, detail, I created a meta-analysis of factors that affect performance. It's called IBEAM. It's our, one of our core models. And any change to be sustainable has to address all five of these variables. But part of that is um, we, when why I don't, no, no, don't do normal training anymore is I just got so frustrated sending changed people back into unchanged environments because the environment always won. And so we get people to change their own environment to make it easier for them to be at their best. And they decide what they want to invest in. They decide what they want to change. And they and we don't, I mean, most of these projects that I did, we wouldn't do any actual training for six months because they don't need training. What they need to do is pay attention and more on the conversations, be willing to try a few new things, begin to uh, adopt a true client-centered framework. And then when they would out, be out in the field doing things, they'd bump into like, oh, I realize I don't, I'm not very good at framing questions. I'm used to being the expert who makes statements. Right. So they might say, great, well, uh, and, and they say, well, can you do a workshop? I could, but I'm not going to. So who in your organization is really curious and really good at them? Oh, well, like Sally, she's amazing. She always has something really clever to say. Great, so why don't you go ask Sally if she'd spend half an hour with your group? And share with you what she's learned about asking questions and then yeah that's awesome because then you can see the strength of the group coming out yeah and everyone's got different strengths and that's when you start exactly to in on and, everyone and then they, and but and then but, but you also then avoid the thing of training somebody before they're ready it's when their appetite and the opportunity is present then we'll teach you because now you can actually go use it so a lot of the times then along the way they're picking up peer coaching skills so they could be out doing a site visit or in a treatment room and they can actually do some little mini coaching of each other. And, and so then by the end of the two years or one year, or three years, whatever it ends up being, they don't need me anymore. And that's my time to go because I know I've made, I've done my job. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So just in talking to you, I realize I'm the idea way is not really for me. It's more of the, the narrative coaching well, only because right. I retired a few years ago. I hit, I hit burnout in 2019 really badly. Mm. Um, uh, and I'm still dealing with it. Um, I'm better, but I just had a lot of trauma in my life, a lot of death in my life. Oh, um, sorry. Just lots and lots. Like yeah. at a very young age, a lot of stuff in my immediate family where I lost well five people by the time I was 42. Wow. So lots and lots of stuff happened. Um, mental health stuff with my my dad, that whole thing, and a sister. So it all. So I just kind of like, and I I realized I pushed through a lot of it by. You know, having a child and being on two boards of directors, and it's like, okay, yeah. am I busy enough to forget about things? Great. <laughs> Can I add more things to the table? All right. <laughs> I'm going to get busier now because you're bringing more things to me that are a problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm learning. I'm slow learner, but I'm learning. <laughs> well, good for you. But I've like done tons of, yeah, I've done tons of work on myself, which has paid off hugely and i just find this whole with the coaching i don't i sort of second guess myself but what i like about this is it also is helping me to be with narrative coaching is being well what's going on for me exactly. in my own life so it's like yeah. 
you know, I want to have a glass. I want to have a bottle of wine. What's that about? Oh, well, I'm, I'm feeling this, this, and this. Okay. That's why I want that bottle of wine. Not one glass, a bottle. <laughs> it's like, urge. <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of like, okay. Yeah. Um, so you know what? I'm Canadian. So it's about a good 3% more for us. I'm like, oh my God. So, um, so I don't know what your, your price is right now. It's 34.97. Yeah. Because we're adding the platform for you to practice on, which, um, is a new cost for us, but also, um, yeah. an extraordinary value. Um, yeah. we do offer a payment plan so you can pay a little bit every month. Well, yeah. I might just do that. It's just kind yeah. of, it's hard to know what the American or Canadian dollar was going to happen. So it's like, you yeah. know, or we can, I can just pay it out too. It's just like, Oh my God, that's a lot of coin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it's, yeah, it's but, with currencies around the world. It's hard because it, yeah. everybody's just so different, and yeah. yeah. But, but it is, it is. Um, I mean, it is over nine months, and I look at that over nine months. There's a lot, a lot of learning and stuff. And I see a yeah. lot of value in it, like a lot of value. And yeah. the fact that you're not going to be around as much next time around, it's like okay, take advantage of of yeah. having them around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now there's two hundred dollars. Over like instead of thirty four ninety five, it would be thirty two ninety seven. Yes. Oh, okay. I'll, and I think I've got that. Um, MI Connect. No, no. Sorry, I've got what you sent us. Um, yeah, the, the website link with the narrative coach on it is, is where the interest list is, which then qualifies you for the discount. Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. So and, and and or if you can just write uh, Emily at MI Connect or Steve, they'll send it, the link to you directly. But then. Uh, if you just pay for it as a whole, then I'll just take the two hundred dollars off right off the top from the beginning. Right, that makes sense. My only other thing is, I'm sorry, and I did I was doing something. Um, so the modules are ready to start looking at once you enroll. No, well, um, they could be. Um, we just finished the last cohort a couple of weeks ago, so um, I'm taking some time next week to kind of go back through all the modules again and see what did we learn. It's pretty settled now. I feel that like the program's in a really good place. But I always feel like, well, you know, the time in between cohorts is the time to look at it. So I've got, so give me till the end of next week and then yep. we'll, um, we'll yep. by, 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 you know, by the middle of November, everything will be up and you can look at it ahead of time. Yep. We won't put most of the, um, we won't put most of the slides up because we, um, uh, we just try to keep it fresh in the moment, but this is our last year. So probably we'll change that and put most things up. And then we might create some special things because oftentimes, you know, there's like a cluster of people that want something in particular that can create a resource around. Um, but yeah, I would think by the middle of November, um, yeah, things would be up. Um, and, okay. Yeah. And there's no rush. I just was yeah. wondering. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so yeah. okay. So just know I won't be on tomorrow at three okay. for the ID. <laughs> okay. That's fair enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really is very, very informative. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to, to working on it, doing it. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Have David. All right. Bye. Okay. You too. Bye.